Let's pray together. Father, we do seek your presence among us this morning. We ask God that you would show us yourself in in your word. That you'd reveal the majesty of Christ to us. Direct our thoughts toward you, toward your word, toward your, your truth, and speak powerfully to our hearts, Father. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You ever heard the phrase, the best defense is a good offense? Ever heard that? It's sometimes attributed to Vince Lombardi, who was a legendary football coach of the Green Bay Packers back in the olden days. Uh, Back in the 1960s, he won back-to-back championships, five national championships, including victories in the first two Super Bowls back in the 1960s. So like I say, it was the olden days, you know. Um, The quote actually seems to have its origins further back than that. In, In 1799, George Washington said, make them believe that offensive operations oftentimes is the surest, if not the only, in some cases, means of defense. He's speaking to the army. and Let them know that the best defense is a good offense often because you're keeping the enemy off balance. There are some people for whom that's a personal mantra. And, and they are aggressive toward you, and you're always off balance with them because they're just always coming at you. The best defense is a good offense. It's a truism that's been adopted by, by boxers and chess enthusiasts and military strategists and coaches across athletic competition. Lombardi used it to communicate to his players that the best way to keep a powerful offense off the field is to keep your offense on the field. And all of us pray that the Detroit Lions has a good offense this year. The Apostle Paul used the good offense strategy when he wrote the church in Colossae because they were, they were facing a growing menace that was arising within the congregation from their own membership of people who had, had a, a, a new super spirituality and, and they, they claimed to have visions from God. They claimed communication with angels that took them beyond the simple pablum of the, bob, the, the, of the gospel into deeper, more secret truths about God and the gospel and, and what God intended. And in the process, in order to exalt themselves and their visions, they raised up the level of these angels and they brought Jesus down until Jesus was just another one of these created beings by God, maybe the highest, but one among them. And that led to another other, a number of other distortions of the Bible because you, you, you don't just affect one area of your belief system, of your theology. There's a ripple effect that goes all the way down. So as soon as you change something here, that has impact throughout the whole system, your whole belief system. As Paul is determined to make sure they understood who Jesus Christ is, and Paul's going to address some of these other distortions later, later in, the, in, in his, his letter, but, but there are people just like these who are still around who bring Jesus down. Who, who, well, I've once received a thick manuscript in the mail from a lady who uh, claimed to have been having visions from God ever since she was a child. And, and she said that Muhammad really was God's prophet sent to the Arab nations and they had distorted it into what is now Islam. And in the same way, the church of Jesus Christ had taken what the prophet Jesus had said and turned it into this whole Christian religion. And now she's got the truth that she wants to reveal to the, the world. Um, I filed that appropriately. When Paul wrote to the church about problems like this, he wasn't afraid to to launch directly into the problem, and especially, for instance, in the book of Galatians. He wrote the Galatian church. He he said, hi, I'm, I'm Paul, and grace to you, and all like that. But then he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I mean, Paul just went straight to the jugular. Just went right there. He doesn't do that in Colossians. 
He doesn't do that. He, he began with thanksgiving. He began with prayer for them. And then seamlessly, instead of naming the problem and attacking it, Paul exalted Jesus as the supreme Lord, the true master and commander of the universe. The best defense is a good offense. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. By the way, a few things to note in these verses. First, Paul's, Paul's complete thought, his sentence as he wrote it in the language that he wrote in the Greek language, begins at verse 9 and ends in verse 20. It's 12 verses long. <laughs> and Paul has a habit of doing that. He started Ephesians the same way. He starts in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he just, thoughts just tumble out all over each other. And he has all these phrases and different things that keep piling up and piling up and all the way down until finally he gets there about a, three paragraphs later. And, and he's, you put a period. <laughs> And that's what Paul does here. Verses 9 through 20 are one sentence as Paul wrote it. Now we break it down for us because we just can't hold all those thoughts together. We don't get all those connections. And, and, and today we're just going to snip out just three and a half verses out of that sentence to look at. But understand this is part of a much larger thought as Paul just talks about these things that just energize this passion and it just all tumbles out all over the all over the place. And then second, as you read through this, what single word gets repeated all over and over again in verses 15 and 20? I just gave you a hint. It's the word all, right? All. Paul uses it eight times. And it 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 just heightens the significance of Jesus' preeminence. All, 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 again and again. And then notice the prepositional phrases. By him, through him, for him, in him, through him, to himself. What's the cumulative impact of this? There's all and to, by, for, through, and Jesus. He's exalting Christ. Jesus really is the central figure, the master and the commander of the universe. And everything surrounds Jesus especially in the church. Many commentators believe that Paul either used or adapted a hymn to Christ that was current in the churches in this portion. He just kind of slipped it in here and they would have known it. Be like reading along and all of a sudden reading majesty, worship his majesty. You know, we'd, we'd recognize that that's a hymn. If so, the, the hymn seems to have been composed in three parts and in our musical vocabulary, uh, verses 15 or 16 would be the first verse. Verses 17 and, and the first half of 18 would be the bridge. And then verses 19 and 20 would be the third verse. And we're going to look at just verses 15 through the half of 18 this morning. Just that portion that exalts Christ. Jesus is, Paul declares, first of all, the image of of the invisible God, the icon, literally, of the invisible God. This means that Jesus, in the fullness of his humanity, perfectly expresses God who is spirit. Nobody has seen God at any time. Jesus makes God visible. Now, Jesus said something similar to this 
in his conversation with Philip in John chapter 14, after telling his disciples he, that he was going away, Philip said, said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. And what Philip was asking for was a revelation of God, kind of like the, the 70 elders of Israel. Remember when they were on Mount Sinai and God had given them the law, and then God invited the 70 elders of Israel and Moses to come up and, and have a banquet with him, and he, he showed them his glory. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel sees this vision of the, 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 the four cherubim, these, these beans and the wheels and the throne above them. And Philip said, show us that. <laughs> show us the Father and then that'll be enough. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said to him, if I've been with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. What's Jesus saying? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. By his words and his works, he's made the invisible God visible. And that's what the incarnation is all about. There's a passage in Hebrews that's almost identical to this. The writer of Hebrews says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in, the, in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, that is, the universe. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Hear that? He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe. He upholds all things by the word of his power. See, in every way possible, Jesus is the embodiment of the invisible God. He's like God in every way. All that it meant to be, to be God was found in Jesus Christ. All that's veiled are the outward manifestation of his attributes in the independent exercise of his power. If we had lived when he was on the earth, we would have seen a man act like God acts. We would have heard God speak and felt God's love and power fleshed out in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's Son who perfectly images the Father. And you don't understand Jesus until you realize that he is God the Son, God in human flesh, who makes God known. He imaged God's character. He imaged God's works. He imaged God's words, claiming to say only what his Father wanted him to say. No other being in all of creation can hold a candle to Jesus Christ because he is not a part of the creation. He is the creator. <clears throat> and so Paul goes on to say he's the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things are created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers, authorities, all things were created by him, through him rather, and for him. When Paul says that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation, some have thought that what that means is that Jesus was the first creation of God. He's the firstborn of all creation. And when we think of firstborn, what do we usually think of? Born first, right? James is my firstborn. <laughs> he was born first. Now, they had a slightly different understanding of what that word means. It can mean born first, and it typically does. And in, 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 in the fourth century, there was a church elder by the name of Arius who, who understood the text this way. He, and he said there was a time when Jesus was not. In other words, he denied the pre-existence of Jesus. There came a time when God created Jesus and he was the firstborn and through Jesus then God made the world. And there's all kinds of errors that flow out of that. But in that, that caused no end of co controversy in the local church, in the churches. And they finally called a council together in 325 AD in the city of Nicene, uh, or Nicaea. And, and they produced what's known as the Nicene Creed which defined orthodoxy. What does the church believe about who Jesus Christ really is? And this is what they declared. I, I'd like us to read this together. Okay? 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father before all the ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. And this defined orthodoxy for the church from then on. By the way, the Nicene Creed is still quoted in, in many liturgical churches. It's, a, it's a, a wonderful part of the heritage of the church. And, and that finding of that early council uh, declared our Arianism, the idea that Jesus is the first creation of God, they declared that unorthodox. They called that heresy. But what we call the Arian controversy is still around today. Did you know that? There's still people who believe and teach that Jesus was the first created being of God. For instance, the Jehovah Witnesses follow the lead in Arius and say that Jesus is the highest first created being of God, but he's not God the Son. He'd say he's the Son of God, but not God the Son. What's particularly disturbing, though, is a Lifeway research survey that was commissioned by Ligonier Ministries a few years ago about the state of theology in America. And in the survey, they asked for a true or false response to this statement. Jesus was the first and greatest being created by God. Now, how would you answer that? Don't say it out loud. <laughs> how would you answer that? Jesus was the first and greatest being of God. What, what they discovered is that while virtually all evangelicals affirm the doctrine of the Trinity and believe he's the Son of God, when asked if Jesus is the first created being, or the first and greatest created being by God, 78% said that's true. 78%, not of Americans, but of evangelicals, people who go to church regularly, who believe the Bible is the Word of God, who believe the gospel is true. Now, to be charitable, to be charitable, I suspect that we're more orthodox than what the survey indicates. Because I realize that the whole doctrine of the Trinity is a hard thing to get our, wrap our arms around. How do we understand who Jesus is? Many regular church attenders would probably agree that Jesus is God the Son. But when it comes to a careful understanding of the Holy Trinity and the relationships between them, we have a hard time articulating that. So that sounds like it might be true. And it's just what we might call a lack of theological sophistication. But we want to be careful and understand that to say that is to be sub-Christian. The first verse of John's Gospel is unequivocal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God, and the Word was God. And John, of all the writers of the New Testament, writes in the simplest language, the easiest Greek. Luke is torturous to read. John is easy. It's like, it's like reading C. Dick Run, C. Jane Run. <laughs> you know, it's kind of that. These are all four and five letter words. But profound truth. What John is saying that you take any place that you want to start and call it beginning, Christ is there. The Son of God is there. He's there with God, and he is God, fully divine in every respect. He shares the divine nature, which is in its essence to be, to exist. God exists because it's his nature to exist within himself. He has life within himself, and there's never a time when he was not, and there was never a time when the Son was not. He has no beginning, he has no end. We affirm that of the Father, and we affirm it of the Son, and that's what Paul is describing here what he calls him firstborn now that's a long explanation of firstborn all right we'll come back to the text when he calls jesus the firstborn he's not saying he was born first but he has preeminence 
Um, by the way, when, when Jesus was confronted with the Jewish leaders, they said, are you greater than our father Abraham? And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They knew what he was saying. They picked up stones. They were going to kill him right there. Why? Because he's, it's blasphemy. He's declaring himself equal with God. They got it. The full eternal deity of the Son of God is what the Church Council affirmed at Nicaea, and it's what Orthodox Christianity has always believed. And what people stumble over then and now is that word firstborn sometimes, among other things, but the, the son born first is the one who had the right of primogenitor. In other words, the, the right of being the, the heir to the family fortune. It meant more than just born first because the rights of firstborn could pass on to another child in the family, but it would be called the rights of firstborn. For instance, the, the, the firstborn is the heir who has the right to speak with the authority of the father, to act on the father's behalf. He always stands in closest relationship to the father. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said about Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom he also created the world. And, and here the writer of Hebrews is tying together Christ as firstborn as well as heir and creator. The psalmist said of King David, he shall cry to me, and God is speaking, he shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him, David, the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. He calls David firstborn, because, not because he was the first king that ever existed. Not even the first king in Israel, because Saul had been king in Israel before him. But because God is conferring upon David a position of preeminence, he speaks and acts as God's heir, God's appointed king. And that's how G Paul uses firstborn here. Jesus is God's heir who stands in the closest relationship with the Father because he is God the Son. And because Jesus is the creator of all, it, it, it's because he's the creator of all the things that Paul calls him the firstborn. Notice how the text reads. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for, because, here's why, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authority, all things were created through him and for him. And I realize I'm throwing a lot of theological stuff at you this morning. Okay, and you may be drowning in it out there. You know, I, I don't know. I hope you're tracking with this. But it's really important that we get this, that we understand the preeminence of Jesus Christ and understand his role in the plan and program of God. He is the creator. He is the one who spoke into existence all things and upholds all things by the word of his power. The Apostle John says the same thing. We already read verse 1 of John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. What's that saying? That everything that exists in our world exists because Jesus spoken into being. He created everything. There's, there's nothing exempt, visible and, and invisible. Things we can see and touch and feel and taste and hear and smell and things we can't. It all exists through the direct agency of Jesus Christ, and it exists for Jesus Christ. He's the rightful sovereign of creation. And Paul goes on and he lists thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities. And some believe that he's talking about human authority and governments and so on like that. I don't think that's how Paul's readers would have heard this, because those were all titles of spirit beings, ranks of angels, that they understood in their, in their worldview how they looked at things. You remember the Colossians, the, the, the false teachers there, were claiming to have visions of angels and revelations from angels. And what Paul is saying here is, I don't know who they were talking to, but whoever it was, Jesus made them. Okay? He's on the offensive here, powerfully showing that whatever spiritual powers may exist... They exist 
because of Jesus and by Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus. And then Paul gives us what we call the bridge. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. This is, ties Jesus' roles together as supreme in, in the universe. He is its creator and the one who sustains it by the word of his power. And in the church, he is our head and Lord and sovereign. Jesus is the dynamic that keeps the world from flying apart. And, and that, there's a lot in here that just kind of boggles the mind. When, when I think of the enormity of creation, <laughs> it boggles the mind. Doesn't you? The vastness of space. I read recently they, they've taken a picture of the, the farthest star that they've seen so far in, the, in this universe, and it is how many billions and billions of light years away. I can't wrap my head around that. I can't figure out how the, what is it, 92 million miles to the sun? <laughs> That's a long ways for me. And then we're just one solar system in a much larger galaxy, in a universe full of galaxies, of billions of galaxies and multiple billions of stars. And Jesus spoke the whole thing into existence. And he upholds everything by the word of his power. All the dance of the planets and the solar systems and the galaxies move at the command of Jesus Christ. All the events on this earth and our lives are held together by the will and the word of, the, of our Creator. This is the one who is the Lord of the church. This is the one who's sovereign in the universe. The one who said to his disciples before he left, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me. And I'm with you always to the end of the age. Folks, that's good news, isn't it? Jesus Christ is our Lord. Not that we possess him, but that he possesses us. We're held in his hand, the firstborn of all creation, God's heir who perfectly images God, the one who holds the universe together by the word of his power is the head of the church, the one upon whom all authority in heaven and earth resides is the Lord of this body, this congregation. And we need a clear understanding of who Jesus is because in this world there's all kinds of messages that would say, no, he's this, he's that, or the other thing. In Islam, Jesus is regarded as God's prophet who didn't die because God's prophet can't die, but he did ascend to heaven and he's going to come back at Armageddon and, and oversee the destruction of the earth and the final day of judgment and defeat Antichrist. Many Buddhists regard Jesus as a great enlightened being, a, 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 a wise teacher who because of his compassion decided not to enter nirvana, but stopped short and came back so he could tell us how to achieve enlightenment. Within Hinduism, there's a strain of thought that Jesus is an avatar or incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu, the supreme deity of the Hindu pantheon. We've already talked about the Jehovah's Witness, and along with them, the Mormon church believe that Jesus is the first in creation of God within Mormonism. He's one of many sons and daughters of God, and God had a plan for, or wanted a plan for redeeming the earth, so Jesus presented his plan, and Satan presented his plan, and God went with Jesus' plan, and Satan got upset, and that's caused the tension between them. Still others deny that Jesus is a distinct person in the Trinity at, at, at all. There's a, uh, a strain within Christianity called Jesus only who deny the reality of the Trinity and they believe in what's called modalism, which is an ancient heresy, that there's one God who sometimes shows up as the Father and sometimes as the Son and sometimes as the Holy Spirit, but it's all one and they're not distinct beings. In popular culture, Jesus is admired as a great teacher or a religious genius or a good man who left us a sterling example of love and good works. Never let anyone deceive you about the 
supremacy of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. Jesus Christ is our Lord. Amen? Amen. Hang on to that. Hang on to that. And as you pray for a new pastor, think about who you're praying to and in whose name you're going to the Father. Jesus has God's ear because He's God the Son and He sits at the right hand of the Father. And He's given us His Spirit. So even when we don't know what to ask for as we ought, the Spirit intercedes for us with words that can't be uttered, but that God knows. And God knows our hearts. And we can pray for a new pastor. And we can pray for the things that weigh on our hearts, that concern us. Because Jesus is Lord of all. Of all things. And He's the one that we worship. He's the one that we serve. He is our Lord. Pray with me. We thank You, Holy Father, that we serve a, a risen Savior, but we serve a Savior who has ascended back to His rightful place at Your right hand. He's before all things. He's above all things. And He is our Sovereign and Lord in Christ. Give us a deep understanding and grasp of these truths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.